Hello, everybody. My name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Welcome to Food Safety Fridays. Today's webinar is Managing Traceability and Recalls. Are you prepared? With our good friend, Len Steed from AIB. Hello, Len. Hey, hi, Simon. Hello, How are everyone. You doing? Very good. Excellent. And you've just been telling me where, where you are. Can you tell the audience where you're located, Len? Yes, I uh, live in Northeast Pennsylvania in the U.S., uh, kind of a rural setting. Uh, I uh, right next to the New York state border, and I've been here about 32 years. That sounds very nice. Um, uh, just to the audience, um, yeah, type in, let us know where you're joining us from. It's always nice to know. Uh, you can see there in this, the comment stream, Len, that uh, literally Morocco, Egypt, uh, New Jersey, USA, Pennsylvania. There you go. Hey, there we go. Uh, had to get one. Um, let you know, audience, as well, we are recording it today. We'll follow up afterwards with the slides and recording. And uh, the Food Safety Fridays is sponsored. So I'm going to play you the video ads and we'll be back for the presentation in two minutes. So if we can turn our webcams off, Len. Okay. The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. Okay, uh, take it away, Len. All right, thank you, Simon. Well, good day, everyone, and thank you for attending. Today, we are going to discuss and present a case for being very well prepared for a real recall by challenging your potentially weak areas and auditing your procedures. There are many good reasons to challenge your recall program because there's updates in the regulations, guidance documents, changes of personnel, and different channels of distribution. We all know that we are responsible as a food company to take unsafe food out of the marketplace. So we want to be in a state of readiness. The purpose of our discussion today is to acknowledge the fact that it is not a good idea to learn how to do a recall during a real recall. So in our discussion today, we will look at typical problems and realities associated 
when recalls are not being done as effectively as they should be. And by doing that, we will keep unsafe food out of the marketplace. We will protect our brand, avoid high cost of recalls and potential lawsuits. So what I'd like to do is give you a little background about AIB. Uh, AIB is very passionate and we have knowledgeable experts in food safety around the world. We work in just about every segment of the food industry. We tend to partner with our clients and find out what their needs are so we can provide those services. Just last year, we had our 100th birthday at AIB. We had a, a very large contingent out at Las Vegas at the International Bakery Expo. And we had many presentations to provide expertise. Our goal is to make people understand that sanitation is extremely important. We will elaborate about this as we go through our presentation. As far as learning objectives, what we're gonna to do today is we're gonna look and see if you have high risk product. I don't wanna be US centric, but the FDA has gone through and assigned high risk product. In fact, they don't assign low risk product. For them, there is no low risk product. We're gonna actually look at the importance of regulations and the guidance documents. Uh, it's very important to stay up to date with regards to the expectation of the regulators. And as we get towards the end of the presentation, we are going to go through what I know as real life scenarios that could occur or have occurred in companies. But let's step back a little bit. We all know that we're going through the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, just from a regulatory point of view, uh, there has been significant issues with the FDA and the USDA. The USDA did not do any recalls from February 8th to the 10th. Uh, we did have pathogen-related recalls from the FDA due to mushrooms. But if we look at the timeline, we see that they were a little bit late in notifying the public. I can tell you this is very unusual. Uh, I don't know if this is the new norm, but I really don't think it will be. The other thing we have to do is look at ourselves. During the pandemic, uh, what we're seeing is people are working very long hours. Uh, some companies have closed down and now they have to reopen. You may be short staffed due to illnesses. You may even have family members that are ill. So this is a very stressful time. And unfortunately, when we're in a stressful time, uh, mistakes can be made. So now we have a poll question. Worldwide, I'd like to ask you, do you think food recalls are increasing? Yes, no, or not sure? Okay, uh, Len, I've uh, loaded the poll in the sidebar. So the question, uh, worldwide, are food recalls increasing? What do you think? Yes, no, not sure. So uh, can you see the poll, Len? Um, yeah, I'll click on it, yes. Yeah, currently around about 50, 50 just over 50% saying yes, uh, about 18% no. And around roughly 29, 30% not sure. So let's just see how that ends up, yeah. Most people think they are, followed by not sure and then no. Okay, very good. Well, let's see the answer here. Well, I can tell you that recalls are in creeks increasing at approximately 10% a year in the US. There obviously is some significant variation between countries that experience large recalls, but I can tell you that recalls are increasing worldwide. So now we're gonna discuss high-risk products. It is interesting, I do a lot of teaching 
And I can tell you that uh, a lot of people don't believe they have high risk product, but let's look at the decade of recalls. I think all of you remember with the melamine contamination in the Chinese dairies, uh, with that went into pet food and infant food, and that caused many recalls, death, hospitalizations. Also, when this product was used in Canada in canned pouch and dry pet food, there were other contaminants that caused foodborne disease and illness. In the US, one of the largest recalls in history was the Peanut Corp of America. They were actually a sub supplier of nut and peanut products that went into almost 4,000 different types of products. I worked in that recall with companies that were having it, and I can tell you it went on for months, almost a year. Another huge recall was basic foods. And according to the FDA, it was the largest recall with over 10,000 different products due to salmonella and HVP ingredients. To give this a little more international perspective, what caught my eye is the South African outbreak of listeria in processed meats in 2017 and 18. There were over 216 deaths and hospitalizations. So this is very significant. Also in the US recently, 2018 and 19, we had six outbreaks in multiple companies with pathogenic E. coli in romaine lettuce. And what is interesting here is that the FDA and the Centers for Disease Control put a lot of time and effort and they still couldn't find the source. The FDA put out a public warning and they notified all people that if they had any romaine lettuce in their refrigerators is to throw it out immediately. In 2019, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, multiple companies, uh, contamination and meat products with uh, pathogenic E. coli. So now we have another poll question. Is your food ingredients considered to be high risk? Yes, no, or you're not sure? Yeah, again, you should see that in the sidebar. The question is your food stroke ingredients considered to be high risk? Um, yes, no, or not sure. And we have the results. Uh, it's neck and neck, yes and no. Yes, it is neck and neck. Uh, and then um, around about 10% uh, not sure. So yeah, probably uh, the, just the majority, around 49%, yes, high risk. Okay, well, very good. Let's elaborate on that. The answer here is high-risk foods can be defined as any ready-to-eat product food that will support the growth of pathogenic bacteria. There is one exception here is that is undeclared allergens. So what I'm going to do is share with you is a kind of a US pers perspective from the FDA. This is a very powerful chart. And quite honestly, it's one of the reasons that we had the Food Safety Modernization Act in the United States. To familiarize yourself with some uh, regulatory parlance, uh, Sakota, that's severe adverse health consequences or death in humans and animals. That's the acronym they use. This uh, pie chart here is out of the fifth annual FDA reportable food registry. This is where they go through and they analyze recall data to see what is causing foodborne disease, disease or illness in the 27 different commodities or categories of food. So what I'd like you to do is look at the chart, and if you were to add up undeclared allergens, 47%, salmonella, 25%, listeria monocytogenes, 19%, that accounts for 91% of all recalls. So it is no wonder why we have the Food Safety Modernization Act, because they believe many of these recalls are preventable. The 47% with undeclared allergens should catch your eye because putting the right product in the right container with the proper label 
and declaring the allergens is almost 50% of all recalls. There's one other thing I'd like to point out. A lot of companies, I reviewed a lot of HACCP manuals and worked in that in my career. And recalls with foreign material are actually one half of 1%. So I'm just gonna share with you is that you can have failures and recalls at multiple levels. Uh, every country has a watchdog group that will go in and check on the activities of all the agencies and the government. In this case, the inspector general did an audit of the FDA. And what they found out was really a little bit shocking. They found out that the FDA did not always follow their procedures and requirements when it came to assisting and helping companies do recalls. They also found that many companies were slow to initiate the recall. They also found out that when you were trying to contact wherever you ship the product, in this case, the consignee, they found that the information was not up to date. So this made doing an effective recall very, very difficult. And then when you get to the closure of the recall, they found that the FDA did not always follow through. So the FDA actually agreed with this analysis and they modified and came out with new regulations and guidance documents. And they started the strategic coordinated oversight and recall execution with the acronym SCORE. So we have to look at the regulations and guidance documents. Every country operates a little bit differently, but I can tell you every country is involved with taking unsafe food off the marketplace. If we go around the world real quick, the China FDA, administration recall of food products. If we look at the European Union, they've had this system in place for years and years. The rapid alert system for food and feed. In India, the food safety, and standards authority. Canada, the Food Safety Inspection Agency, the Mexican Bureau of Standards. So we understand that every country has a recall program, many, many more. But I want to look specifically at the Food Safety Modernization Act. Probably one of the most important things that have come out is the supply chain program. And this is where someone on the food chain be it the supplier to the supplier, the supplier, you the receiving entity, your customer or your customer's customer has to take responsibility for the food safety hazard in writing. Uh, I just wanted to mention it because many people believe that this is the most significant update with regards to regulations. So we have another poll question here. What I'd like you to do is answer, do you know what recall regulations and guidance documents apply to your products? Yes, um, in the sidebar again, question, do you know what recall regulations and guidance documents apply to your products? Yes, no, not sure. Let's have your answer. And I'm hoping, we're hoping for a majority on yes, uh, Len. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, I, it's getting to look good. Yeah. So it's around about just below 70% do uh, no, 15% um, no, and 15% uh, unsure, not sure. Okay. Well, the time to learn to do a recall and read the guidance documents is not during a real recall. So the answer is your company should have all applicable recall requirements for your country and the country that you ship to. This would include any guidance documents and forms which must be filled out and submitted to the regulators reviewing your recall effectiveness. The whole point here is you'd like to do it ahead of time. So now we're gonna look at a perspective on recall requirements. Uh, obviously the crisis management team must get together. But again, we're in the COVID crisis era right now. Uh, this team will have to decide whether they do a recall or not. 
I don't know if you're aware, but in the U.S., they have the reportable food registry. And that's where you would have to inform the FDA through an electronic portal that you think your product's unsafe and you need to take it off the market. The crisis management team is responsible for analyzing this data and notifying the FDA. You need to have defined responsibilities and procedures, uh, traceability of your raw materials, including your packaging material. And most important, you have to have that contact list that is up to date. And when we get to our scenarios further in the presentation, we'll find out that some companies weren't as prepared as they thought they were. Also, you would have to quarantine product and make sure that it was brought back. So the actual mechanism for the removal of product would be to quantify uh, what product was distributed, how much was sold. We would need to have our consignees or distribution or customers actually collect the product and return it to us. And in the end, we need to have product disposition, which typically, if the product is believed to be contaminated, it's not going to be reprocessed, it's going to be destroyed. But there are recalls where the product isn't contaminated, and that would be subject to reprocessing. At the end, we would have to have a debrief to see what went right and what went wrong. And then we would get our imp suggested improvements and or corrective action to make the program better. So this is an overview of what the expectations would be with regards uh, to the US. They actually have all the templates, forms available to you. Uh, the whole point here is you may think about having these filled out ahead of time for the most common or likely scenario for the type of products that you make. You would have a model press release, which includes a picture, the code dates, the reason for the recall, very briefly, uh, contact information. You would also have the volume of the product. You would also have where it was distributed. Uh, to a geographic region. The list of wholesalers, distributors, repackers, both retail, consumer, and don't forget, a lot of companies have internet and catalog sales. This would also include foreign consignees or companies, and then if it went to the government itself. So again, all of this information could be prepared ahead of time. Continuing on with uh, other recall requirements, you most important thing is that you'd have a list of the companies or consignees that you sold it to. You would need a documented recall strategy. To explain this further is depending on how complicated your distribution network is, you would come up with a strategy with how you're going to carry out the recall. So this is actually a step before actually doing, performing the recall. I've been involved with many companies that have had to have recalls, and I can tell you from day one, you're doing effectiveness checks. You have coordination with regards to sales, marketing, distribution. If it's a particular ingredient, you're working with the plant with regards to what lot code of a certain ingredient that was contaminated went into what. So again, this is a very uh, stressful time and anything you can do to prepare ahead of time is well worth it. So in the end, we would have our, uh, our product disposition. We would tally what we got back versus what we shipped, what could still be in the marketplace. And then at some point we would have to terminate the recall, do our debrief and look at what can be improved. So another poll question here, would crisis management exercise and internal audits reduce recall errors and increase effectiveness? Yeah, the final po poll. I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm hoping for 100%, Simon. <laughs> 
Yeah, would crisis management exercises and internal audits reduce recall errors and increase effectiveness? Surely it must. Um, well, you voted. Uh, One percent have said not sure. Uh, okay. No knows. Zero knows. Or it might be a fraction. Or, but uh, anyway, ninety. I don't know where the other one percent is. Ninety-eight percent yes. One percent not sure. And uh, maybe I don't know. <laughs> okay. Very good. What I'm going to do is share some real life scenarios with you. Obviously, uh, crisis management scenarios, internal audit will certainly improve your effectiveness. So I'm going to look at some real life crisis management scenarios that I've worked with in companies. The first step is what is the most likely Sakota event for your type of product? And no matter where you are in the world, you can get that data from the regulators. For example, in bakery snack food, undeclared allergen, if you recall back to that slide where we had 47% of recalls are due to undeclared allergens, in the snack food and bakery category, they were responsible for 24%. As I mentioned, I teach a lot of HACCP and HARPSI training programs. And routinely, I ask the class, uh, a lot of them in the baking industry, do you make high-risk product? Their answer is typically always no. But yet, all of the recall data would say otherwise. If you look at mild ripened cheese, listeria, if you, have, if you use nut products, you have mycotoxin and salmonella. Fresh fruits and vegetables. There's a variety of pathogens, but pathogenic E. coli would be the worst. And then you get into animal-based products like dairy products, meat, poultry, seafood, egg products. You have a variety of pathogens and egg products, pathogens, pesticide residue. So scenario one to do, number one, pick the product that has the most difficult complex distribution system. So you would look at your own system. What would be the most complex? You would use that as a scenario. Typically, I work for companies uh, that have multiple outlets. They sell to restaurants. They sell to sandwich shops. Some could have internet sales and catalog sales. I had a company last year, two days before Christmas, they had uh, recall due to undeclared allergens. And this went to all of the uh, large retailers. They even had internet sales and catalog sales. This was a very difficult recall. Consider doing an ingredient, lot code trace for raw materials used in the finished product. So we want to test and challenge that. In this case, you would convene the crisis management team you would perform your mock recall, do your gap analysis, and document where your improvements can be made. Crisis management scenario number two, and this again is a real life story. I worked for a company that uh, had several hospitalizations due to salmonella in their product. The company received a call from the health department that your product has been implicated with three people getting sick, two of which required hospitalization. The company got a call at 4.55 p.m. and the regional FDA office informed the company that they would be arriving with the inspection team at 9 a.m. the next day. So again, this is a real life scenario. It might not have happened to you, but it has happened. And I can't imagine what a company will do when the FDA is coming in for a four cause inspection. In other words, they know something with, went wrong and now they're going to find it. Scenario number three, your internal audit of your distribution and sales department finds the following issues. 22 additional retail store deliveries were added and we're not on the recall distribution master list. No address and contact information. 
your products are now being shipped to companies that are making gift baskets. In other words, the uh, people running the recall, typically the plant people, didn't know about it. They also make uh, sell to fundraiser events, internet sales, but these entities were not on anyone's list but sales. So again, I'm, I'm not pointing the finger at sales, but uh, most people that have been in the food industry know that sales and marketing tend to be not always involved in the plant operations. And this is a real life scenario where they actually found that there was additional customers and distribution, but the plant people, typically the ones that do the recalls, were not aware of it. So getting to summarize here, are you prepared to do a recall? Recalls are a way of life in the food industry. I'm on a notification from the regulators and every single week I get, could be five, could be 10 different recalls due to uh, undeclared allergens or pathogenic bacteria. You need to know what your high risk ingredients and products are, the ones that could cause a Sakota event. Again, going around the world, Recall regulations can be a little bit different, but the end goal is always the same. They are there to protect public health. So it's good to be on an update for any new regulations or guidance documents that come out from the regulators. Hopefully I've brought up the point that it is always better to have all your forms filled out, go through your crisis management, realize what the typical problem could be with your ingredients and raw materials and finished product. And from there, you can set up a program and do your crisis management analysis. You can also focus your internal audit on potentially weak areas so that you can find these problems before they become a regulatory issue or injure your brand or worst case scenario result in a lawsuit. So what I'd like to do is uh, point out that uh, AIB is there for you. Uh, we have a guide uh, for recall and traceability. Uh, right now it's not up there, but we have uh, COVID-19 updates every single week, typically on Monday. All of these are on the AIB website. Uh, they're recorded, so they're available to you. The other issue is that we need to be prepared and ready for a recall. So if you have any questions, please feel free to get a hold of us at AIB. I threw this in there because I'm a big fan of Winston Churchill. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So we got through this in pretty good time, Simon. I was wondering if there's any questions. Yes, the, there's one or two, and there'll be lots more, no doubt. So if you can switch your webcam on, we can start uh, picking through them, Len. Thanks very much for that. And we will include a, a link to that guidance um, document uh, on the AIB website in the follow-up uh, email. So, right, let's get started uh, with Anna. Uh, if, there are, if there are defined guideline, guidelines as to the percentage of products recovered stroke trace, as 100% is not always the case due to waste loss during production, is there a tolerance plus or minus of 100%? Well, again, that, that would be related to how complex your distribution chain is. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, with that company, I talked about the chocolate company that had the recall two days before Christmas. In the US, your legal responsibility is one step forward, one step backward. But the FDA actually came back and put pressure on them uh, for internet sales and you know other sales that were not you know catalog, uh, people that bought their product product and resold it. 
But to answer their question from a practical sense, you're never going to be collecting and getting back 100%. So it really depends on the industry. The real key point here is that you would put forth your best effort and prove that you did just about everything you could do to get the product out of the marketplace. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Michelle, uh, what are the responsibilities for businesses who only warehouse and ship shelf stable foods, but do not manufacture them? Well, if you're a warehouse and distribution, uh, you have to register with the FDA. So you're, you're essentially a food plant and you're responsible for getting unsafe food out of the marketplace. So if you, you have to keep records of who you ship it to, the lot codes, all that. So you would be responsible for assisting the, the uh, company with regards to getting product out of the marketplace. Although the question wasn't asked, uh, I just recently read uh, the Pew Charitable Trust actually did 27 retailers on their ability once notified to take the product off the grocery store shelves. And it was quite shocking to me that there were only three out of 27 that actually did a good job and others delayed. Some cases, the product was still on the shelves well after 24 hours of notification. Mm -hmm. Not good. Um, Okay, Kuhn Yolk Young, will the needs, uh, basically, when you're doing a mock recall, uh, do you physic need to get the physical product back or is it just, uh, um, you know, a paper exercise, let's say? It's, it's a paper exercise. But what I see a lot of people doing, particularly with distribution systems that are, quote, not as reliable as they should be, they will actually ask them to do the inventory to segregate and then they will send somebody to actually verify their effectiveness because think about it this way uh there are good warehouses and there are warehouses that aren't so good and that even a delay of a couple of days or not getting all the product and isolating it could lead to foodborne disease and illness so there's extra measures you can do. I, I would use the internal audit or third party audit system to go in and verify that they can execute the recall effectively. OK, and uh, Lorenzo, uh, thanks for the clear presentation at the beginning of the presentation. Maybe I've misunderstood. Why have you considered as high risk ingredient exclusively from microbiological and undeclared allergen point of view in RTE foods? And what about mycotoxins or heavy metals or PCBs? Yes, all of those, all of those are contaminants. And uh, if you look around the world, uh, you know, certain recall situations come up for certain reasons. I was giving you kind of a US centric view and that is that pie chart is very accurate 91 percent of all recalls uh per the data from the fda and the centers for disease control are from those three things but as you go around the world you will see different issues uh you know chemical contamination like you mentioned with the pcbs uh i recently saw uh eggs that were contaminated with pesticide residue. Mycotoxin is an issue. If it's in the food chain, it'll get into the animals, it'll get into the milk. So those are all very valid uh, issues that uh, the gentleman pointed out. Okay. And Maud, uh, how, <laughs> so a airline catering recall, if the flight's taken off with contaminated products, Meat, dairy, or how do you how do you contain that? Recall it. <laughs> That's an excellent question. Uh, believe it or not, in sanitary transport, which is another of the Food Safety Modernization Act rules, uh, airlines are exempt. But I can tell you, early on in my career, AIB did work 
for commissaries that supplied the airlines. And I'm going to suggest to you that you don't eat the airline food. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, you won't be at the moment anyway. There's no flights. Um, That's right. Uh, Ishan, do you know anything about ISO 22000? Can you explain the mock recall with respect to ISO? Similar in most standards, I guess. Um, the process. Yeah, yes. They're asking about the food safety system certification 22000 and then the technical specification. Um, all of the GFSI standards, be it BRC, SQF, FSSC, they're all uh, benchmarked to a the the same standard. So typically, all the requirements would be represented in there. But although you are complying with your GFSI requirements, part of the point in the presentation today is that you really want to get your hands on the regulations for recalls in your country and any country you ship to. And if they have any guidance documents, the reason I mentioned guidance documents is because guidance documents are written in plain English or plain communication. They spell out what the expectation is. So then you will have a very clear picture as to what you need to do. Okay, great. And uh, Aaron, what about quick service restaurants, recall? It is not possible due to complexity of the product. I, yeah, I, I can tell you right now, when you get to retail, there is weakness. And I've helped companies do recalls. I, I can give you an example. Uh, I can give you two examples. One was a bakery that sold to hotels, restaurants, commissaries, sub shops. They could have literally hundreds of contacts. The people in these type of businesses often change. So their contact list was never up to date. Uh, then you get into warehouse and distribution where companies are selling to uh, stop and goes, little retail stores. They may have thousands of people mm -hmm. that they're selling to. So the idea that you could go there and have them get the stuff off the shelves. I can give you examples uh, with very large companies where they don't trust the retail people. They actually send their own people to the store, the same people that deliver product there, and they take the product off the shelves itself. Okay. <laughs> and Susan, our product will be sold via internet and our customer call center managed by a third party. Where can I find an example audit? of a service provider such as a customer care center? That's an excellent question. And I, I can tell you how they would do recall traceability. They, in this case, they already have the contact list and they already have the information, the email address. They would notify them directly through that system. I can give you another example of technology. Uh, about two years ago, we uh, bought peanut butter at a large grocery store. They actually scan it. They have our information because we're part of their buying club. I actually got a text on my cell phone telling me there was a recall with this peanut butter. So, yeah, the uh, technology's there, and we just have to make sure that it's in place. Yeah. That's a good idea. Uh, do you know Robin Wallace by any chance? Uh, I don't know if it's Robin, he or she, but they attended a course, a HACCP course of yours in the 90s. Oh, right? my goodness. You're making me feel old. The, 19, <laughs> the 1990s. <laughs> uh, uh, well, all right. Tell them it's time for a refresher course. Definitely. <laughs> um, where the heck am I now? Uh, right. Catherine, uh, what is the difference between product removal and product recall? Uh, a product recall is where company has made the decision that they have potential or actually unsafe food in the marketplace. One distinction I didn't make is that 
you have to notify the FDA if the product is out of your control. In other words, uh, it's not in your warehouse. If it has gone into distribution and it has entered commerce, then you would have to notify the FDA. But there's there's no real distinction uh, in those terms. If you're doing a retrieval, uh, you, you've already made the decision. I mean, there's companies that recall product due to quality reasons. Yeah. So. Okay. And I've, I neglected to say, Robin, the second part was thanks for the good foundation for my years in quality. Well, thank you very much, Robin. Okay. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> okay, Roy, uh, how is a mock recall ideally conducted? Um, most standards require it to be done. What's the suggested frequency as well? Most most people do them typically twice a year. What what I'm uh, what I would suggest is that you would actually try to make a real scenario similar to what I outlined in this training today. You would know your most difficult distribution channel. You would know uh, the the most difficult area to trace, so you would test it. Uh, the big mistake that a lot of people make is they don't make sure that their contact list is up to date. And that actual internal audit finding happened in the company I was working with. So those are the potentially weak areas that I would probe, but the crisis management thing, do it on a Friday afternoon, do it on, I've seen people test their mock recall on weekends, Obviously, the employees get a little upset when you do that, but that's that's a real life scenario. And in some cases, they they couldn't get a hold of the people necessary. Okay, uh, Viv Viviana, if my product is sold to a repacker, my responsibility goes to my client or my client's client. Everybody on the distribution chain, you you have the lot codes and the product that you you sent to your repacker. Your repacker has the responsibility to keep those records. So the FDA requirement is you have to do a recall one step forward and one step back. So everybody on the distribution chain, obviously if it's your product, you would be involved in the recall and and assisting and making sure that product was was returned to you. Okay, uh, Anita, no, Annie, Amy, can you uh, explain your question a little bit better, please, if possible? Uh, Amika, uh, Valentine, um, okay, in the case of fish, if the label states contains fish without listing all the different types of fish present, is it considered an undeclared allergen? If the label states contains fish without being specific on the types of fish? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I am not a label expert at AIB. We have a department that does that, and actually uh, rules and regulations change. But I do know about uh, seafood HACCP, and I can tell you that some people could be allergic to one species of fish, but not to another. So in the U.S., you would actually have to put the species of the fish. Okay, and uh, Rock Shinara, for retail businesses, what will be the recall product recovery? Is the recall information provided to the customer considered enough? So I guess that's in a retail supermarket. So if they put signs up and put notices up saying recall, is yes. that enough? Yeah, when they, uh, when they came out with the seven rules of the Food Safety Modernization Act, they actually included some of the retail responsibilities. If there's a recall in the location where you had ice cream in a freezer or a product stored in a certain area, they would actually have to post the actual recall notice at that area in the, in the retail store or supermarket. Okay, just before I give you another compliment, one more. Question, uh, question. <laughs> Stuart, we quickly and easily are able to trace our product to our customers and confirm receipt within two hours, often less than an hour. During the mock recall, we had an auditor state we needed those customers to locate those shipments 
and indicate how much is recoverable at the time of the mock recall. Is this true? Uh, that's a very tough question. Uh, the auditor may have been going over their bounds with the, re with the requirements here. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can answer that question. But if you have a standard, if you have a regulation, it's usually pretty black and white as to what the expectation is. Uh, when you look at timing, the regulators aren't looking at hours. They're, they're looking at your ability to do an effective recall. And the reason they don't put in timing is, is because all the distribution chains are different. So, you know, it's, it's not going to work. But if Stuart's managed to communicate and identify which customers the product's gone to, it's, is it up to those customers then to identify they've got to do their step of it? Has he done his step by communicating to his customers? Are you talking about the end customer or someone in the distribution chain? If you, if mm. it's the actual customer that is consuming the product and you notified them, then I would think that you did your, your duty with regards to expectations for okay. the recall. Okay. Uh, Tony Ketiku, Highland Steed, AIB best manager. Hi, Tony. <laughs> How are you? Uh, <laughs> uh, Jacqueline, uh, how is the best way to make recall exercises with real customers? I've, I've seen some people do this with a, a very good customer. They'll actually, uh, do a mock recall or crisis management exercise together. And what they usually do is they actually send people in. Uh, to the warehouse distribution just to verify that the warehouse is doing the job properly. And they will also do that with regards to retail. And I'm not picking on anyone, but I can tell you that retail can be weak. And I mentioned that Pew Charitable Trust uh, review that just came out last year. And it's kind of a telling story when only three out of 27 retailers were thought to do an effective recall and take product off the shelves. Okay. Gloria, uh, what type of documentation um, supports a recall plan? I guess that's records, is it? Or... Well, you'd, uh, you've got several procedures. You, you have your traceability, which is pretty much implant mm -hmm. where you know what lot codes went into what. You have your recall plan. In other words, roles, responsibilities, who's going to do what. And the whole point of our presentation today, knowing your weak areas, you would bring in your crisis management team and use that procedure to actually say, can we really under stress on a weekend, Friday, five minutes before five o'clock, execute a recall properly. Okay. Uh, for some reason, I, I haven't got any more. The chat's disappeared for me. Has it for you as well, uh, Len? I will take a look. All I can see is... Uh, oh, there's some more coming through now, but some have disappeared. Um, how do you check the effectiveness of your recall or mock recall, Linda? All right, it's, uh, it's pretty much a numbers game. In other words, you uh, shipped X amount of product, uh, was X amount of product received? Uh, did you collect it there? Again, the expectation is not 100%, but I can tell you some people actually go over 100% because they have margins of error. They, they do a little bit before and a little bit after just to make sure, but uh, again, it's a numbers game. It's how much did you ship? How much did you collect? How much was consumed? And that's the data that you would have to, in the US, you would have to supply that to the FDA or the USDA or which segment of the food industry you're dealing with. Okay, and next one, Victoria. Uh, should a mock recall include contacting the client? 
themselves? Typically it doesn't. It, it only, you, you would only contact the client during a, a real one, or if you were executing a crisis management exercise and you notified them ahead of time that this is an exercise. Because most companies can execute a paper recall very easily. We have computerized systems that will actually, it's minutes or less that you can know what ingredient went in, what product, where was it shipped, here's the list. But the whole point here is that you would dig a little deeper, maybe audit that contact list and distribution list to see is it up to date and accurate. And I'm not telling tales out of school, but usually when I would do that, I would find some level of errors. Yeah. I mean, would it add value to do it maybe with one or two key customers uh, to to sort of help them may perhaps test their system as well? Yes, as long as they understood it was a crisis management exercise. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Moise, Moise is, um are spoiled or damaged products uh, not of health risk considered for a market recall? Uh, so if it, well, spoiled, um, if, if you look at most regulations, spoiled, you know, moldy product isn't really a health hazard, but it's uh, contaminated food. So uh, I can give you an example. I've seen a lot of uh, dairy companies have their yogurt go moldy a little early, primarily because of problems in the distribution chain. There's different levels of re recalls. So this could be a class three recall, which is no apparent health hazard, but you're still taking it off the market. Class one is death or injury. Class two is may cause a reversible health effect. So okay. that's a. Okay, Hamza, uh, what's the best time to do an efficient mock recall during working hours or after the working hours have ended? It depends if you want to have everybody in the company know your name. No, I'm just kidding. The uh, fact is, is that I would, you could do your normal recall just to make sure your procedures are accurate. Everybody's familiar with it. It's really the crisis management that you would actually really challenge your program. I, I've seen people do recalls on uh, weekends. I've seen them do it during holidays. And that really tests your system. You don't have to do it several times. Once a year is typically enough. Uh, because what you'll find is if, if you don't have some key people there, the, the ones that really make the system work, you're going to be spinning your wheels and that that recall won't be effective. Okay. And uh, Akriti, uh, let's see. Uh, can a food business operator initiate a recall termination on its own, or is it the FDA who decides it? There, there would be consensus. Uh, in other words, if you had a real recall, you would have to call the regional FDA office, and then the communication starts. Uh, they would send you the forms necessary to fill out and there are a significant amount of forms and information, typically an Excel spreadsheet. And you would have to not only tell them when you notified, but who you notified, how you notified them, and then it gets into the quantities of product. So the whole point of my talk today is you would like to have these forms filled out ahead of time for the most likely scenario so that you don't have to go through that very painful process of trying to collect all this information during a real recall. Okay, Nilesh, what should you do with food that's been recalled? It depends what it was recalled for. If it's for pathogenic bacteria or uh, undeclared allergen, I guess your options are is that you could reprocess or relabel uh, usually when it's pathogenic, it's always destroyed and you would have to have confirmation of destruction, uh, typically at a landfill. 
Yeah, and Vicky, uh, expired products beyond expiration date, do they need to be recalled? No, <laughs> absolutely not. In fact, uh, we all know that uh, you could have an expiration date or Best Buy, but typically the shelf life uh, exceeds that. And if uh, expiry date, you that would not cause a recall situation. It would have to be actual contamination of the product. Okay. Uh, Paramus, Paramus Warren, what is the acceptable time limit while performing a mock recall? <clears throat> uh, I've seen many expectations. I've seen two hours, four hours. Uh, uh, the real thing that will dictate is how difficult and complex your distribution chain is. If you're a manufacturer, you're selling to uh, uh, one company, they have a distribution center. Well, your recall responsibility is probably going to be very simple. On the other hand, you're a, a, a bakery. You're selling to multiple outlets, restaurants, hotels, hospital commissaries. You know, it's the more contacts you have to make dictates the complexity of your recall. Okay, and Insha is asking, can you reuse packaging from food that's been recalled? Oh boy, I, I wouldn't do that because the product has gone out of your control. It wasn't in your plant. So in many cases, if, if it's gone to retail, you have no idea what was going on there and what environment your product was in. Okay, that makes sense. Oswaldo, is it mandatory to test the recall? Uh, most, most countries in the regulations would recommend that, that you would test your recall program. And uh, I, I think it makes sense to just about everyone that if you've never tested your program, you've never used your procedure, you have never looked at your contact list and then you're doing a re-real call, then, then that would be problematic. Okay, Moises, normally SFDA is asking that mock recall should be within four hours. You should trace the product forward and backwards. Is it the same for FDA? The, uh, the FDA and the regulators are not going to specify any time limit because they don't operate that way. It's industry that typically starts to put on uh, time limits. But yes, the four hours you talk about are very common. Uh, I've seen it two hours. So yes, those are customer expectations and that you have to live with as well. Okay. And Victoria, um, for exporters to the US, uh, conducting a re uh, recall, so do we have to notify the importer and the FDA about the need for recall? Okay, if, if you're a company outside the US and you are shipping product to the United States, you would uh, need to register with the FDA. In other words, anyone shipping product to the United States, food product would have to register just like a company would domestically. And yes, you would have to notify the FDA if it was a recall, and you would likely notify your foreign supplier verification importer. In other words, the person in the US who is the consignee or is actually buying the product. Okay, Mickey Terra, do we need to notify FDA for voluntary recalls even if the recall is not related to food safety? Yeah, I, I would say it would be uh, you. There is a very legal document. It's a, uh, a product withdrawal, but it is in the FDA recall procedure. So if it wasn't food safety, if you were taking it off for a quality reason, it would be a class three recall. It's it's no apparent health hazard, but still the class three recall is represented in the FDA regulations. So I'm assuming that you would have to contact them. By the way, I'm not a lawyer, but I do know a lot about food safety. 
<laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Karen, we have customers purchased from our website. We record lot numbers going into our website store. Is posting a recall on the website enough, or do we need to contact each customer that has ordered? Uh, it, if this website is your website, um, I'm, it, it depends. If you're going to the retail customer, you could maybe on the website it'd be enough. But if you are selling that product off the website in any quantity for other people that are reusing it or repackaging it, then they would definitely have to be notified. Mm -hmm. So it depends again on your distribution chain and if you're selling direct to the consumer surely you know which consumers have bought what products and eat and in with emails and databases you can send an email to all customers with the effective batch codes because yes. essentially you're, you're trying to keep the public safe aren't you so by all means necessary to try and get that information out there yeah and i've seen uh, large supermarket chains put out public notifications. They, they got the database. And I mentioned before, on my cell phone, I got a text from the grocery store telling me the, re the peanut butter I just bought was being recalled. So, yeah. yes, there's, there's a lot of different ways that uh, the customer can be notified. But in a very bad event, the FDA would put it into the media. Yeah. It would be a public notification. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, are recalls only based around lock codes then since expiry dates don't matter as much? Or would a situation occur where the recall is based on the expiry date of a specific lock code? Whatever your identification system is for tracing that product, that is the key thing. That, in other words, when you go into a warehouse, what lot code or numbers or coding are you looking for? That is the important one. The expiry date or best used by would only be important if it was actually being used to trace that product. Okay. Uh, a COVID-19 one. Uh, what if we discover that one of the workers on a food chain factory uh, was found COVID-19 positive? Should we recall the products? As it stands right now, and the FDA has come out in Centers for Disease Control, is that uh, COVID-19 is not uh, transmitted in food. That's, that's what they've said. Yeah, so the answer is no. Kayla, if you ship to individual customers via a website to the USA, but you don't ship to wholesalers in the USA, do you need to be registered with the FDA? Well, if you ship to customers via a website to USA, but don't ship to wholesalers, do you need to be registered with the FDA? All right. <clears throat> are, are, are you just taking product in, from a warehouse and sending it to a customer. In other words, there's a legal definition of a process wholesale repacker. Uh, I, I think you would have to look into this further. If you are storing product, you are a warehouse and you're shipping it. Or on the other hand, you could have a contracted warehouse and you're not storing anything, you're having them do it. So the question is, do they have to be registered with the FDA? Okay. Um, how do Rubika, how do we deal with products uh, already shipped in rural areas who are not that much tech savvy? Okay. <clears throat> Again, uh, the, the rural areas have to have some method of uh, communicating where if you had unsafe food, even if it was in a rural area, your responsibility is to take it out of commerce and not have people get sick and injured. So it really doesn't matter where you are. You would do your best to make sure that the product was uh, taken off the shelf and not consumed. Yeah. Uh, 
a compliment <laughs> to Mr. Leonard. Your experience and real life case or studies are super interesting. I wish we could hear more of them. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you've been going now for, we're supposed to be going for an hour. We've gone 10 minutes <laughs> over. Uh, and the, the presentation was quicker than we thought. So, uh, yeah, I think we're going to have to wrap up soon uh, because it's never ending. <laughs> um, Noah, what is a nonconformity if the list of contact person for recall is not accurate? As an auditor, do we have to test the contact details to establish effectiveness? So that's one important thing, isn't it, surely? Contact yeah. Details. Yeah, I, I think that's the reason it's in the presentation because i i've done thousands of audits uh a third party auditor may view that as something i mean it, it it's a non conform conformance but it's it may or not be a major one the whole point of the presentation is you can test it in your internal audit program and if your contact list is not up to date and it's not accurate then you aren't going to be notifying who you need to and if it's a worst case scenario, it's pathogenic bacteria, undeclared allergen, that's a class one recall, which means death or injury. So it's important. Okay. Um, Trudy, uh, Len's answer was that currently FDA say cannot be transferred through food, COVID-19, so you don't do a recall. Um, well, the recall is up to the company. <clears throat> oh, right. Okay. It's not up to me. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the FDA said, the, is that correct that you said it cannot be transferred through food? They didn't say anything about doing a recall due to an infected patient or yeah. an infected uh, worker. What they did say in the Centers for Disease Control, that it does not appear that uh, food can transfer right. COVID-19. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Um, finally, Dana Shri, what about a situation where the product needs to be recalled due to faulty labeling and not because the product is unsafe for consumption? What needs to be done according to FDA? Uh, if the label, <clears throat> excuse me, if the label isn't accurate, uh, in other words, there's an extra ingredient that wasn't mentioned, or you're missing some ingredients. I've seen that before. It comes under a class three recall. And okay. a lot of people would call it a market withdrawal because there's no apparent health hazard. Okay. And a couple of people have asked at the end, how many times? I think you've said twice a year, mock recall. I would say, I would say twice a year. Uh, again, it depends on the complexity of your distribution chain. Uh, the takeaway from my point of view is really use your crisis management exercise, pick the worst thing that could happen to you and see if and experience that so that you're ready during a real, real call. Brilliant. Okay. <clears throat> that's a, that's a wrap. Super, uh, presentation and also the Q and a absolutely brilliant, uh, <laughs> Tons of questions and lots of great uh, answers. Thanks for that, Len. Really you appreciate you appreciate your time today, um, and we Thank will um, follow up and put a link to the guidance document at AIP, <clears throat> so that'll be useful for everybody. Thank you, Simon. Take oh, care. Yeah. See you again, Len. Thanks very much. Cheers. You bet. Uh, okay, ladies and gents, uh, that was Len Steed. It was great to have his expertise today. Um, and uh, some of you commented, you know, Len, from your past. And, um, yeah, <laughs> and you've given him lots of compliments. So he's going to go away happy, as all you will and I will. And what co more can we ask? So happy Friday, everybody. I've issued your certificate in the sidebar. Print it and sign it or edit it in an image editing package and add your name yourself. I'm not doing that for 1,800 people. I can't. I'm sorry. But have a great weekend, everyone, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks. <laughs>